Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 243 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. How did ideas about the American Revolution develop and spread? Ideas were an important component of the American Revolution, and for the revolution to be successful, it needed to have ideas that people could embrace and methods for spreading those ideas. It also needed ways for revolutionaries in one city to share their ideas and coordinate with revolutionaries in another city. So how did revolutionaries accomplish all of this? How did they develop and spread their ideas and communicate with each other so that they could coordinate plans of action? Historian Joseph Edelman has found that the revolutionaries accomplished this large feat with the help of printers and the networks printers established to receive and spread news. Now, Joseph Edelman is an assistant professor of history at Framingham State University and the author of the book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News, 1763 to 1789. Joe is going to help us investigate the work of printers and their ability to create and spread information. And as he does, Joe reveals the physical and intellectual labor of the early American printer, how print shops worked and the different media they produced, and details about how printers developed and used information networks to feed their presses and the American Revolution. But first, did you know that the best way for podcasts to find new listeners is when friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts? It's true. People are really much more likely to listen to a new podcast because a friend or family member recommended it. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's world, please tell your friends and family about it. Okay, are you ready to venture into the early American print shop and find out more about printers and their information networks? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Framingham State University in Massachusetts. He's a historian of media, communication, and politics in the Atlantic world, and he's my digital projects teammate at the Omohundro Institute. Today, he joins us to explore the roles printers played in the formation and shaping of political ideas during the American Revolution, with details from his book, Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News, 1763 to 1789. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's world, Joseph Edelman. Thanks for having me back, Liz. I'm excited to talk about the book. Yeah, and we're delighted to have you come talk about it. Now, speaking of your book, in Revolutionary Networks, you make the case that printers played a crucial role in how political ideas developed and spread during the American Revolution. So, Joe, I wonder if, to help us see where you're coming from, if you would take us inside the early American print shop and tell us about how printers went about the work they did. Sure. So, printers existed in what I would describe as a mushy middle of society, which is one of the things that makes them really interesting to study. So they are, on the one hand, artisans. They're manual laborers. They're people who work with their hands, setting type and pulling the press every day as the work that they do. And that groups them with a bunch of other manual laborers in sort of the lower half of society in colonial America. But at the same time, many of them are engaged in the intellectual work of editing, of writing, of engaging with what we could call the intellectual elites, the ministers and doctors and lawyers who are producing texts that they're then publishing. And so they sort of exist in both of those spaces at the same time or in between those spaces, depending on how you want to think about it or envision it. And that makes them really interesting figures because they're doing both of these things. So in the colonial era, when I say a printer, what I'm really describing are master printers in the book. That is people who own usually and operate their own printing offices. But a printing office would involve six or eight, even 10 or 12 people at work at the same time in an office. And what the master printer did really envisions what we'd now describe as three separate roles. So on the one hand, there is the physical act of printing, of setting individual pieces of type into line to set them on the printing press, 
ink them, set the paper, pull the press, and do all of that physical labor that we would today describe as the printing. They often served as editors, that is, that for some of the texts that they published, they were making choices about what to print, about how it should be written and designed and things like that. And then they also often served as publishers, as the people putting the financial backing for a project to support it. So they produced a variety of goods. All of them did what we would call job printing. And that's the equivalent today of, you know, if you go into Staples and say, I need 20 copies of this poster, right? Somebody might show up in a printing office and ask for copies of something that could be a broadside, what we would call a poster, that could be a small pamphlet, it could be some other custom order, legal documents that were sort of pre-filled out forms that you just had to write in the names, things like that. So they all did that. Most of them published an almanac, those little annual handheld publications that had a calendar, it had weather forecasts, it had little sayings, all sorts of other things. And it was one of the most popular publications in colonial America. Almost every house had a Bible, and that you really only need to buy once, but an almanac you need every year. So printers tried to make sure they printed those because it would make them a little bit of money every year. They then printed pamphlets. These are short texts, 50 to 100 pages, usually not bound with leather binding. They would just be sewn up and sold loose. Some printed some books, though that's not a particularly popular thing in the colonies because it was a really, really expensive undertaking. And then a fair number of them print newspapers, which is one of the central focuses of the book and thinking about how they're approaching the revolution. But they're publishing this wide variety of items, and it varies from office to office depending on the exact place and the exact success of a particular printing office. But that gives you some idea to start of what a printing office does and what printers do. You talked about how printers perform both the intellectual and creative labor of editing and composing and also the physical labor of running their shops and their actual printing press. And I wonder, where did the printing family fit into all this work? Because in Revolutionary Networks, you mentioned that the work of the printing family was crucial to keeping a print shop going. So would you tell us about the printing family and the roles these families played in keeping these print shops going? Yeah, so family is really important in colonial America generally as an economic unit. It's the basic unit of economic life, where today business historians or business scholars would describe the firm, right? A business entity as the basic unit. In colonial America, what we're really thinking about is the family, where everyone is working. And that includes both biological kin, the master printer, his wife, his children, possibly his nephews or nieces. And then also what we would call fictive kin. So the apprentices that you've taken into your shop to train in the trade. And everybody works, everybody plays a role, and everybody has something to do to make the office a success. So the master printer is the one who's in charge of overseeing everything and is doing a fair amount of physical labor and also the labor of dealing with people who come in. For many printers, their wives are key figures in the printing office. So Benjamin Franklin in his autobiography, for example, talks about his wife, Deborah, folding and stitching pamphlets, buying rags for paper. The paper was made out of rag linen. Wives sometimes kept the books, the accounts for the shops, or ran a separate stationery shop or book selling outfit out of the same space. And then you'd have journeymen who are adult men who aren't able to run their own shops, who are hired labor and apprentices. These are teenagers, usually between the ages of about 14 and 21, who are being trained to become master printers eventually. And so they're doing a wide variety of work. You know, they might start by sweeping the floor and cleaning things up, everything up to being in charge of setting type, pulling the press and activities like that. And so you really need that whole family at work in order to make the business a success. And I would add, when we're thinking about apprentices, Oftentimes, those apprentices are family members, are either the son of a master printer, very often it's a nephew of the master printer, or a cousin, something like that. So these families become important in a longer term sense, because those apprentices then, they achieve a 
majority. They reach the age of 21. They want to go open their own shop and they need help getting set up. Well, who's going to do that? Well, their father and former master may well do that either in the same town or more often in another town because there's not usually enough business to double the number of printers in a town. And so the family network becomes important in that regard as well. So there were really two aspects of the printing family, both the actual family of the printer who would help run the shop and the networks of printers who were and became related to one another, you know, because of how they're training and working. Yeah. And they can become actually quite large. So the best example is in New England, the Green family, who I talk a little bit about. And that lineage goes back almost to the very beginning of printing in the English colonies to a man named Samuel Green in the 1630s, 1640s in Cambridge, Massachusetts. By the 1760s, the family is all over New England and even down into the mid-Atlantic as far south as Annapolis, Maryland. And based on the records I was able to put together, at least 40 printers active in the 1760s and 70s at the beginning of the Revolutionary Era had some connection to the Green family, either because they were among the cousins, great-grandchildren, right, those real kin, or had served apprenticeships or been partnered or worked as a journeyman for someone in the Green family and so had that kind of connection. And the difference that that makes is it makes it easier if you're trying to sell a pamphlet and you have extra copies. Well, if I am a Boston Green, I can send it to my cousin who works in New London or in New Haven, Connecticut, and send him the last 50 copies I have and see if he can sell them, right? And he's doing the same thing with some of his. And it just, it sort of smooths the tracks of trying to make the business work, of making the financial side of it work, to have those kinds of connections. Yeah. Speaking of the business side, how did printers make the finances of printing work in the 18th century? Because you mentioned that they printed a whole variety of publications and media within their shop, which would have required some financial outlay, and that they might sell the works of other printers in their shop or their works in the shops of other printers. But what was their actual business model? Well, my first response when you ask how they make money is to say, well, they didn't. But of course, it's more complicated than that. The thing that's important to note, though, to elaborate on the idea that they didn't make money, is that printing is not, for most of these men or women, a particularly profitable business enterprise. They're trying to get by. The successful ones can bring in a little bit of extra money. But really, before the American Revolution, there's one person who becomes enormously successful as a printer, and his name is on your podcast. Right. That's Benjamin Franklin. And everybody else is basically operating, just trying to get by. So the business model, such as it is, is to try and get a printing office set up, which is relatively expensive. It costs about a hundred pounds in the colonial era, which is many, many, many times what a printer would have at the age of 21. And so they often need help getting set up. And what you need to get set up is a printing press, which is a wooden contraption with an iron screw and some other iron pieces. And those iron pieces, because they're manufactured, need to come from England. There's not usually the manufacturing capacity in America before the revolution to do that. You need type, which is actually the most expensive part of the printing office. It costs quite a lot more than the printing press itself, which has those few iron parts, but is after all mostly wood and so has relatively replaceable parts. But the type is made of lead and a few other metals. And there are no type foundries. No one in America is making type until the very, very late 1760s. And if you want type of any decent quality, it really has to come from England. So that has to be imported. So it's an expense on its own, and then it has to be imported, which adds an expense. And so many printers, when they're first starting out, will start out with a hand-me-down, for lack of a better word, set of type from a master or from someone in town who just died and they're having an estate sale to get rid of that printer's belongings. And so you'll buy sort of cheap secondhand type. That means that people are often seeking partnerships when they're trying to start an office. That could be with a former master. And that's actually something Benjamin Franklin excels at. That's part of what makes him such a success is he takes his own printing office and turns it into a training ground to send out printers to various other places. And so he retires himself from the printing trade in 1748. But well into the 1760s and even after the revolution, 
He's got printing partnerships, not only in Philadelphia, where he had been, but in New York, in New Haven, Connecticut, in Maryland, in Charleston, South Carolina, in a couple of different places in the Caribbean, where he's populating his former apprentices, getting them out of Philadelphia so they can't compete with him, and then setting up partnerships where he pays to get them set up because he has that financial capability, and then takes a share of the profits. Others sought other benefactors. So just to give you one famous example, Isaiah Thomas, who's a very strong patriot printer in Boston, he pretty clearly got help from John Hancock in getting his shop set up in the early 1770s. Now, all of that is just to get your office set up, and you haven't even yet bought paper or ink, and you haven't sold anything. So what you're looking for are things that you can make steady sellers. So things like that job printing, selling those pre-printed legal and commercial forms, things like an almanac where you can, as long as it's of a reasonable quality, guarantee that you'll bring in some money each year. And that's where a newspaper becomes important. It's not necessarily a money maker. It doesn't bring in huge profits, but it's a way to generate revenue because you can make money, bring in money from advertisements. And advertisers, you can actually make them pay in advance. You also have then subscribers to the newspaper and subscribers are often delinquent in paying and printers beg them to pay and say, we're going to take away your subscription and stop sending you the newspaper if you don't pay up. And we really mean it this time in their newspapers. But of course, they never stop sending out the newspaper because they want people to see it and see those advertisements. And a newspaper is usually printed weekly. And so it's a way of making sure that you're in the public eye every week, that they see the quality of printing work that you do. And so if a merchant or a minister or a politician has a printing job that they need done, they see your Virginia Gazette and they say, oh, well, you know, he does a pretty good job. We want to make sure we take our business to him because he's going to do a good job with this piece that I need published on its own. So the goal in terms of a business model is to try and get some steady sellers, some things that you can sort of guarantee you can move to make connections to that political and religious and commercial elite so that they'll bring you their business. And then to just try and make sure you're consistently producing a quality product so that people see you and will want to purchase your products otherwise. I then add as a final thing that they often have then other related businesses going on. So they'll often run book selling operations. They're not printing books, but they can import them from elsewhere in the British Empire very cheaply, often from Dublin, actually, because the way that copyright laws worked, the copyright applied in London and didn't in Dublin, so they could get cheaper copies from Dublin, or to run stationery, right, to be selling paper, things like that. So having those sort of two things together could make them, if not profitable, could make it a livable trade. So it really doesn't sound like a lot of things have changed between the 18th and 21st centuries in that if you want to make money in the media business, then you really need to develop multiple streams of income. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned that Benjamin Franklin stood out as the one printer who was really able to make money as a printer before the revolution. And I wonder, what made Franklin exceptional in this? Was he able to make money in unique ways that other printers simply couldn't make money doing or hadn't thought of doing to make money? Well, he did better with his almanac than most. Poor Richard's Almanac, which I'm guessing a lot of listeners are familiar with, if not in the name, in some of the maxims that were published in the Almanac. There's these little spaces that Franklin and others would insert little one-liners, basically. So haste makes waste, or a stitch in nine saves time, all these sort of little sayings he became famous for, and he sold those. He also made particularly good use of his connections. So he earned, and a lot of printers sought, government contracts for printing things. So early on in his career in Philadelphia, he got the contract to print for the Colonial Assembly, which is a really great thing to have because it's a lot of business and the government you know will pay, or certainly at a much higher rate than random person who walks in off the street. And so it's a big job to have, but it means that you know you have that work, you know you can make X amount of money. How did he make money? He printed money. He had contracts for printing money for Pennsylvania and for New Jersey and came up with some innovative ways to avoid the possibility of counterfeiting. He also got an appointment as 
the postmaster of Philadelphia, which is another way to bring in money, another way to put yourself in the public eye. So Franklin's more successful, but a lot of the other printers are doing these same sorts of things. They're seeking out government contracts, either with colonial assemblies or the governor of a colony. And they often have two separate contracts for those. Each of those entities controls their own printing and publishing of the laws, the journals, the records, money if they're printing paper money, and those other sorts of connections. Franklin's better at it than a lot of others, and that's what makes him the most successful, but they're all sort of pursuing those kinds of things. I'd like to turn to newspapers, because one of the key pieces of historical evidence that Joe focuses on in Revolutionary Networks is the newspaper. So Joe, what were newspapers like in the 18th century? And why did they seem to serve as a cornerstone of so many printers' businesses? So newspapers in the 18th century did not look like newspapers now for anybody who still even looks at a physical paper newspaper. They were almost exclusively before the revolution published weekly. A few printers tried to print two or three times a week, and most of them did that for a pretty short time and then went back to a weekly schedule. So they're printed weekly. They're four pages, so they're one large sheet of paper that's folded once to make four pages. And the size of the paper varied a little bit depending on who made it and where it was made and things like that. But to give you a rough estimate in modern terms, each page was about roughly like an 11 by 17 page would be today. And again, there's some variation, but that gives you a rough estimate. And what they would include is political and commercial news. So they're mostly aimed at a middle and upper class audience, mostly aimed at men, though some women. And each week, what they would include is about a quarter to a third of the space. So one to one and a half pages, sometimes as much as two pages, if a newspaper is really successful, would consist of advertisements. So those would be for local businesses. Those would be for services, people who, especially in the largest towns in New York and Philadelphia and Boston, music teachers or tutors or things like that would advertise sort of personal services. There would be rewards for lost or runaway things or people. So there's lots of ads for runaway horses. There are, in a lot of newspapers, ads for runaway enslaved people, not only in the South, but in the North as well. Franklin printed a lot of those in his Pennsylvania Gazette. They're printed in the Boston Gazette. There are ads for runaway wives, not to try to get them back so much as to disclaim any financial burden. My wife ran away from me. If she tries to spend money, you can't come to me for it, that kind of thing. Ads for ships that have come in and the goods that they carry. So a whole range of things. And that's actually, in a lot of ways, the most local part of the newspaper, because most of the rest of the news was imperial or intercolonial, was from elsewhere in the colonies. So a lot of news from London, the social and intellectual and political elites in each colonial town are really interested in what's going on in London, what's going on in Parliament. Our fascination as Americans with royal gossip is not new. They were interested in the births of Queen Charlotte, George III's wife, of the affairs, and I mean that both in the nice way and the not nice way, of the royal family and members of the nobility. In news from other colonies, one of the things that shifts as we get into the timeline of the book is that there's more news from other colonies, and they're much more interested in the politics of other colonies and political protest. And then there's usually a small section for local news, and that would sometimes be commercial news. Here's a list from the customs office of the ships that have entered and left. It might be some political news, but really there's not as much local news because we're talking about a relatively small audience in each town. And so they kind of know what's going on in their own town. To give you an example that I often use, Boston has about 15,000 people in the 1760s, roughly. And to think about who's politically active, well, half the population are children, so they're not active, so that already cuts out half the population. Another half of the population are women, and they're interested in what's in the newspaper. I don't want to say that they're not, but they're not thought of in the same way as being interested. So you're already down to 25%, you're down to a little under 4,000 people, and then up 4,000 adult men. And of those 4,000 adult men, most of them are poor, or many of them are poor. So we're really talking about 1,000, 1,500 adult men of some status in Boston, 
1763, 1764, they talk to each other. They know each other. They know what's going on politically and commercially. So what they're really interested in is what's happening in other places. Yeah. And I'd really like to explore this interest in other places because, as you just mentioned, 18th century newspapers did contain lots of news and politics from other colonies, which means printers would have needed sources in other colonies and places to get their news from. And this is what Mark wonders. Where did printers get their news? I know in episode 200, we talked about how there was this link between the imperial postal system and printers, but is the postal system where printers really received their news from other places? Well, they get news from three different places. The mail is definitely a key component. But the first one I'd say is essentially oral reports. They literally get reports from somebody walking into their printing office. It might be somebody locally with local news. It might be a ship captain saying, I just got in from London or I just got in from Bristol in England. Here's what's going on as of six weeks ago when I left. So you'll see paragraphs in these newspapers that say, we hear that such and such has happened. And sometimes I think that's a a rhetorical gesture. Sometimes I think that's just the way they frame things. But I think a fair amount of the time, that is literally somebody walked in off a ship and said, here's what's going on. So they get things that way. The mail then plays a role in the other two ways, which would be through manuscripts, through handwritten documents, or through printed documents. So one of the reasons why printers want to be postmasters is that gets them first access to news. There's not home delivery of the mail in the 18th century, for the most part, in a very few cases there are. But for the most part, you have to go to the post office to pick up your mail. And so if you do that, if you're the postmaster, merchant comes in, picks up his letter from London, opens it while he's standing there and starts to read it. And often these letters among merchants who are sending them back and forth primarily include not only their sort of business doings, I'm sending you X, Y, Z, you owe me X, Y, Z money, right? Those kinds of things but also include more information about what's going on in London. Here's what I've heard about this act that Parliament is considering. Here's what I've heard about a change in government ministers. Here's what I've heard about, right? And so, you know, Merchant Smith is standing in the post office slash printing office, reading his letter and says, oh, this is interesting. And the printer's ears perk up and says, hey, can I borrow that letter and take that paragraph out? And so the newspapers will include paragraphs that are There's no headlines, but they'll be labeled extract of a letter from a merchant in London to his friend in this town. And you'll get then a paragraph of London news or Boston news in Philadelphia, right? Could be any two different places. And so being the postmaster means you get access to those first because people literally walk into your office and open their mail while they're standing and talking to you. So if all of this news is coming via people in these personal letters and ways, did Printers ever worry about printing fake news, as in one of these personal reports about what was happening, say, in London was false? They did. One of the difficulties with figuring out how they worried about it is a problem of sources. So one of the challenges of doing this project, to back up for a step, is that for most printers, there are not a lot of their own records that still exist. For Franklin, because he was already incredibly famous in the 1750s and 1760s, many of his, most of his letters have been saved. And most of the letters people wrote to him and he wrote to other people. So he and a few other printers who were still active and connected to him, we have a lot of their correspondence. For almost everybody else, I have at most, not me, but archives along the East Coast, have a handful of letters for before the revolution. They didn't save things particularly well. Manuscript, handwritten documents that they were using to publish things, they were literally using, right? They're setting next to them as they're setting type, as they're inking. So I think they literally used up some of the paper. And then for anybody who was at work before the revolution, during the revolution, their papers often are lost, either because they move. Many of the printers have to leave their offices during the war because of one or the other army coming through. And so we just don't have a lot of paper. So I don't have their words. I do have their works. I have their printed product. And so when we're thinking about fake news, the ways to see it or to see their concern about it 
is to see things that they add. So to give you one small example, in 1781, in the Massachusetts spy, Isaiah Thomas, who is one of these printers, he was in Boston up to 1775. And then right before Lexington and Concord, he escapes with his printing press 40 miles west to Worcester and gets himself set up in Worcester. So there's a story that he sees from the New Jersey Journal of a battle in the Caribbean, a naval battle in which the British Navy was defeated by the French. And it was published as just a short paragraph in the New Jersey Journal. He saw it, and the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, which is actually an archive that he founded later in his life, has his copy of the New Jersey Journal. He put a little X next to that paragraph, and then he added in his own handwriting a little sentence, this account wants confirmation. And when you look at the Massachusetts spy for the next week, the little paragraph is printed, and they add in square brackets, this account wants confirmation. So he clearly saw this and thought it was interesting news, but he was also cautious about it. So added a little caveat, added a little addendum editor's note to say, I'm printing this, but I don't know if I trust it completely. And so, you know, they're worried about fake news. They're worried about getting things right. There are errors. There's another historian who found the example. George Washington at the Battle of Brandywine, the Continental Army loses the Battle of Brandywine, and the news arrives in London via Edinburgh, via Scotland. And the printer in Edinburgh made a typo, literally set the type wrong and killed George Washington. And so for a brief time, people in London thought that George Washington had been killed at the Battle of Brandywine because of a printer's error in Edinburgh where the news had come through, right? And so these things can happen and do happen, but it's something they worry about. It's something that's difficult for me to understand exactly what they thought about because I have to go through these sort of sideways hints of what they're thinking of things like this Isaiah Thomas example, rather than just having them, you know, writing down for me and for other scholars and, and anybody else who wants to read it, you know, I'm worried about this kind of false rumors. I'm worried about making sure the things are right. So now that we have a basic understanding of how early American printers worked, how they acquired information and how they made some money, we should talk about the business of printing during the American Revolution. But before we go down that road, let's take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. Can you believe how much work printers undertook just to make ends meet? They acquired news and information, verified that news and information as much as they possibly could, composed lines and paragraphs to convey that information, and then they set type and went about the work of actually printing whatever it is they were printing. Plus, they also had to contend with the business side of finding subscribers and advertisers, getting those subscribers and advertisers to pay, and then getting their printed products into the hands of anyone who would buy them. I know I've simplified a lot from what Joe just told us, but still, printers undertook a ton of work. And I think it's somehow fitting for an episode where we're talking so much about printers in the news that I reveal a newsworthy headline that's fit to print. The Ben Franklin's World Shop is getting its first round of limited edition t-shirts. These shirts will only be available for a short time. They're limited edition, and they're designed to help you celebrate and commemorate the 4th of July. You don't want to miss out on these shirts, so visit benfranklinsworld.com shop and check them out so you don't miss out. And while you're looking at our limited edition designs, you might also check out our regular t-shirts, tote bags, and hoodies. You can feel great about any purchase you make from benfranklinsworld.com shop, because not only will your use of these goods help us spread the word about Ben Franklin's world. They'll also generate some funds to help us keep this podcast going. So visit benfranklinsworld.com slash shop and order your new and limited edition Ben Franklin's World t-shirts, tote bags, and hoodies today. And thank you for your support. So Joe, in Revolutionary Networks, you noted that you approached your study of printers during the American Revolution using techniques and methods from book history. Would you tell us about book history and how its approaches helped you see that printers really did play an influential role in the development and spread of political ideas? Book history is an interdisciplinary field, so it includes historians, literary scholars, bibliographers, sociologists, librarians, archivists, a wide range of people interested in books and other printed texts. And the idea of the methodology of the approach is to think about the book essentially as a material object to think not just about the words that are written on the page, but to think about 
how a book or an other printed text was made, how it was put together, how it circulated, who did all of that work as people who contributed to a text. So one of the things that I found as I was reading and starting to think about this project is a lot of historians of the American Revolution look at printed texts and say that they're important and even say that the circulation is important and that it's important for their arguments to work, for the arguments of those scholars. But then they just analyze the text. They look at what Thomas Jefferson wrote or Thomas Paine or John Dickinson or John Adams, whoever, and say, well, in common sense, Thomas Paine wrote X. History of the book says, well, hold on a second. We need to think about who else is involved in creating that text. It's not the same thing when it's produced in a pamphlet versus when it's excerpted in a newspaper versus when it's produced in a really expensive, fancy edition, you know, with gilded edged pages, right? Those are different things and people interact with them in different ways. And so we need to think about it. So the way that that helped my approach is it got me into thinking about the printers as really active participants in the creation of political arguments about the American Revolution and about British imperial policies and seeing how what they did made a difference. And speaking of printers taking an active role in the American Revolution, you know that both American and British printers had this idea that there should be a free and open press. Would you tell us what these printers meant when they said that society should have a free and open press and whether this view informed the roles that American printers would come to play during the American Revolution? So the free and open press is an ideology of the press that most printers subscribe to before the revolution in name, if not in practice. And it's very important to think about the two parts of it. So when they say a free press, what they mean is free from government interference. That is free from a government entity saying, this is what you are allowed to print or censorship after the fact. So they're thinking about it as a what we would call a negative liberty. It's a freedom from something rather than a freedom to do something. And then when they say open press, what they mean is that it's open to all parties, that they are platforms, that they are forums, their newspapers and their other publications for debate about political, social, economic issues. And what that does is it sets the printer apart from society. I am providing this newspaper as a public forum. I am the printer of it. I set the type, but they often describe themselves as mere mechanics. That is, they sort of reduced their role to the physical manual labor of printing element of it and projected that out to the world. And this comes from, surprise, surprise, Benjamin Franklin, who articulated it in 1731 in what's now called his Apology for Printers where he had gotten in trouble for printing an advertisement that used a mocking term for ministers. And he published in the newspaper, you know, I'm just the printer. I just set the type. I'm open to all. And sort of most printers up to the revolution continue to follow that or continue to at least project that that's what their philosophy of printing is. Some of them take that very seriously. They very carefully adhere to the idea that they are printers who provide forums for debate, that tends to happen in a couple of scenarios. One, where, most importantly, where a printer is the only printer in town or publishing the only newspaper in town, because that means you literally have to be open to all. You're usually in a town where you couldn't afford to alienate a third or a half of the population by taking a side in a political debate. It also is very true, as I've sort of become familiar with many of these printers, with what I would describe as the politically nervous, the people who are not actually interested in being politically engaged, that they sort of step back and say, well, hold on, I'm just the printer, I'm an open forum. But for a lot of printers, and Franklin actually does this quite skillfully when he's a printer in the 1730s and 1740s, is it opens up space for them to be political because they have the defense of, I'm printing an open forum. So what happens during the 1760s and 70s, as there are protests against the Stamp Act or the Townsend Acts, printers will get into their office three accounts of a street action, of a crowd action that happened in another town. Which one do they print? Do they print the one from 
their green network cousin who they trust? Do they print one from a Patriot newspaper where they're starting to sort of lean? Do they print one where the account is the governor's proclamation denouncing the crowd action as a riotous mob, right? The printer gets to make that choice. And the printer, in making that choice, is then presenting a particular kind of politics to his readers in his town in Charleston or Williamsburg or Annapolis about what his readers should be thinking about uh, that particular action. And so it opens up that space where they can say, I'm not a politically engaged participant. I'm the printer providing an open forum. And here's what I've got for you. Okay. So how did this change during the American Revolution? Because all of early America during the 1760s and 1770s, at least British North America, became very political during these years because it was the American Revolution. Yeah. Well, what happens, there's sort of three roads you can take. You can become a patriot, you can become a loyalist, or you can try to remain neutral. So for the ones who try to remain neutral, they're straddling things politically. They are often, to be honest, working in towns and cities where there's not strong patriot sentiment. So the extreme example of patriot sentiment would be Boston. There are strong patriot printers. There's a few who sort of remain neutral or above the fray, who often end up getting tagged as Tories, as loyalists. And then there's a few who just say, you know what, we're strong loyalists. They seek really strong government support from imperial officials. So John Mine and John Fleming end up printing for the American Board of Customs that's based in Boston, right? And they just sort of shelter themselves within the cocoon of British protection. And that's their thing. But in a place like New York, by contrast, there is a lot of loyalist sentiment. And so it's a lot easier politically for them to either choose to be loyalist and be loyalist in a relatively open way, or to choose to remain neutral or to remain nebulous in the way that they describe their political sentiments. But for the philosophy of a free press, what develops during the revolution is the idea, and this comes from England in the 17th century, that the reason that you want to be free from government interference, the reason that you want to be open to all parties is to serve as a check on government corruption, to serve as an entity, an institution apart from government, outside of government, independent of government, so that you can check them so that you can serve in opposition to them. And that gets really tricky after the end of the revolution, because all of a sudden, the people who are left, the patriots, who once had been in opposition to government, are now supporting the government. They're interested in trying to help set up a national government of their state and of the United States. And that creates a lot of tricky situations as they think about how to organize that. But people continue to think that the free press is important. They describe it in several state constitutions as a bulwark of liberty, right? As a sort of defensive, like a fort that protects liberty and the people against government oppression. And that avenue then, it's in, I think, about eight of the first state constitutions is what leads it into the First Amendment. And of course, then there's a long genealogy that brings us to today in the way we think about a free press today. But there's a really important shift that happens during the revolution. Because the people who win go from thinking of themselves as oppositional to government, as protecting the people from the government, to trying to figure out how to integrate themselves as protection from government and yet also at the same time part of it. So printers really wielded a lot of power in that they had these open forums, these platforms in the form of newspapers and other printed materials, and they selected what to print and which ideas to print. And I wonder, were there other ways that printers work for or against the revolution? And did they create and shape the ideas of Americans just by choosing what ideas to print? So in addition to oral reports and manuscript reports, the third area that they're bringing in is from other newspapers, which they're getting either through the post office or through their own subscription. And one thing that they're doing and that I spend a lot of time talking about in the book is choosing what to reprint. So most of what's printed from other places, obviously, is reprinted from other newspapers. So in those situations, you need to pick. And sometimes you'll have two or three accounts, or you'll have a choice of a variety of news, and you're only printing once a week. It's sometimes a struggle to fill up four pages, but sometimes it's not, and you're making selections. 
And so you need to pick, do you print a document from the governor of Virginia? Do you print a letter from the Boston Committee of Correspondence? Do you print an account from New York of a meeting of the Sons of Liberty? So part of the point of what I'm arguing in the book is that printers are making these choices and each individual choice seems relatively insignificant, right? In any given week, a printer is making a couple of these choices and it's moving things a tiny little bit. But overall, as printers are making these decisions week after week and year after year across town after town, 45, 50 newspapers in the 1770s reproducing this news, that leads to a pretty big impact. So one thing they're doing is simply making those choices week to week about what news gets reprinted, what deserves reprinting. They're also, though, getting active themselves in politics. So the loyalists tend to be active with loyalists. The patriots get active in these other groups that get formed. So the Sons of Liberty form in the wake of the Stamp Act protests. And in several different towns, printers in that town are central to the organization of the Sons of Liberty. So Peter Timothy, who's a printer in Charleston, South Carolina, is a member of the Sons of Liberty in Charleston. William Bradford, who's a printer in Philadelphia, is a pretty important member of the Philadelphia Sons of Liberty. Benjamin Eads, who is with his partner, John Gill, running the most radical printing office in Boston, is a member of the Loyal Nine, which is the core group that becomes the Sons of Liberty in Boston. So they're getting involved in those kinds of groups. By the early 1770s, they're getting involved with committees of correspondence, which were an organization that most colonial assemblies had a committee by that name. But in the early 1770s, Boston organizes towns and cities to have their own committees of correspondence to organize imperial protests. And the printers get involved with those organizations. And so the best example I can give you is one of my favorite stories, is about the Boston Tea Party. So printers have worked to create these networks. They've worked to make these connections back and forth. They've worked to get involved with organizations like the Committees of Correspondence. So in December of 1773, after the tea had arrived in Boston and Boston Patriots refused to allow it to land, a standoff ensued where the ship captains want to unload their other goods and leave, the governor and the customs officials won't let them leave unless they pay their customs duties, and patriots won't let them land anything. So on the evening of December 16th, 1773, the Sons of Liberty, you know, disguised, board the ships and dump the tea, right? This is a familiar story. What happens next is that the print networks and the communication networks take over and spread the news. So Paul Revere and his poor horse head out south from Boston and west, to New York and then Philadelphia as an express rider at really rapid speed. So it usually takes about two weeks to get from Boston to Philadelphia. Revere does it in eight. It's about half the time. Arrives in Philadelphia on December 24th, on Christmas Eve. So the printers of Philadelphia, including William Bradford, our son of liberty, who's been active in that group and the Philadelphia Committee of Correspondence, prints a one-sheet version of his Pennsylvania Journal and calls it a Christmas box for the subscribers of the Pennsylvania Journal. And on that one sheet, he prints a variety of news that I can identify where it comes from. So a big chunk of it comes from the Massachusetts Spy, from Isaiah Thomas's newspaper, from the morning of December 16th. So the very last moment before the action against the T. There's then some handwritten letters, things that are written about or identified as handwritten, a letter from the New York Committee of Correspondence from when Revere had stopped in New York that talks about their reaction to it. And then there's an account that appears nowhere else. And I am all but convinced that this is Paul Revere himself walking in and saying, here's what happened, describing the events of the tea being dumped. And Bradford prints this up, this one sheet thing. It happens by extremely fortunate coincidence that the very next day, Christmas Day, in Delaware Bay, 15 miles south of Philadelphia, people see the Polly, the tea ship that was headed for Philadelphia. They stopped the tea ship. I think it was about 10 miles out. When you got within 10 miles of the port, you were required by law to stop and report to the customs office. So they stop him before he gets there. So they avoid the Boston problem, right? They're reading what happened in Boston and learning. They're avoiding that problem. They bring the ship captain into Philadelphia to a huge town meeting where several thousand people show up the day after Christmas. 
they show him the broadside, make very clear to him that he has no interest in having what happened in Boston happen to his T-ship, kindly suggests that he turn his ship around, which he agrees. And so they give him Jose's and restock his ship for a return journey to London and send him off. And I always feel for the sailors on his ship who had just spent November and December, which are not fun months to be out in the middle of the North Atlantic traveling, who probably were very much looking forward, even in Philadelphia in January, to having some time on land, who then immediately turn around and spend most of January and February back in the North Atlantic. But what the key part of the story is, is the communication networks are activated and ready to go when something big happens. They've been doing all this work over a decade. They've been making these connections. They've been joining these political organizations. And when the tea gets dumped in Boston Harbor, they are ready to go. They are ready to use those networks. And it works out really well because of when the tea ship showed up, that the tea ship happened to show up right after. But it's because of all this groundwork that printers had undertaken with political and social leaders to create these networks and to create these pathways through which they could circulate their news. Okay, zooming out here, why do you think it's really crucial for us to understand these printers if we want to understand the American Revolution? What does a better understanding of printers have to do with our understanding of the revolution? Yeah, well, I think it changes our perspective on how the revolution happened. And I think I'd go back to talking about the book history methodology, the idea of thinking about these texts of political arguments as being produced and circulated and created by several or many, many people rather than just one. And so studying printers brings in a slightly different group of people and a group of people of slightly lower social status than who we often think of in terms of the political rhetoric of the revolution. It brings in their commercial interests. They're sometimes doing things for political reasons, but they're often doing things because it's good for their business and trying to figure out how to bring in some money. And so something like a very famous set of arguments, John Dickinson's Letters from a Pennsylvania Farmer, which Dickinson had them published in Philadelphia newspapers, 12 letters beginning in December of 1767 and extending into March of 1768, those get reprinted in 25 or 26 different newspapers across the American colonies. That's happening because the printers in those places are choosing to do it. Dickinson is trying to get his friends in some other cities to encourage the printing of them, but it's happening because the printers are choosing to do it. The arguments become important to Americans because lots of them are reading it because the printers in their printing offices are looking at these letters and saying, hey, I need to reprint this. I need to get this in front of my audience. They're choosing to then pull them together from the newspaper and print them as a pamphlet. It gets printed in a dozen pamphlet editions in Philadelphia, in Boston. Franklin is in London. He has a pamphlet edition made up in London so that an English audience can access this material. That's the work of the printers. They're, I think, to throw out another metaphor, they're the connective tissue of what's going on. Even when we see an argument like something like John Dickinson or like Thomas Paine's Common Sense, those arguments are filtered through, promoted, are circulated through the actions of printers, through their own political interests, through their own commercial interests. And that makes a pretty big difference in how we see the revolution and what matters. Business interests mattered. Business interests mattered to thinking about the politics, and it mattered at the core of what we think of as the politics of the revolution in those political arguments, in those narrations of political protests, even in that very core of what we think of as the politics of the revolution, printers are there. Printers' business interests are there. So that's why I think we need to think about printers and think about their contributions. Now let's jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Now, while reading Revolutionary Networks 
I learned that Benjamin Franklin dispensed advice to his former business partner, David Hall, about how he should look upon the Stamp Act crisis as a business opportunity rather than as a crisis for his business. So, Joe, in your opinion, what might have happened if Franklin hadn't sold his printing business to Hall and he had had to weather the American Revolution as a working printer? How would printer Franklin have handled the American Revolution? And do you think he would have influenced the revolution in ways that were different from how he actually influenced the revolution? I love this question, and this question is bending my brain. So I'm going to give you two answers, one of the sort of close up to the Stamp Act, and then a sort of bigger picture. So close up in the Stamp Act, Franklin in 1765 is in London as the agent for the colony of Pennsylvania, essentially a lobbyist. And he's also deputy postmaster general for North America. So he himself has an imperial post. So in 1765, he is not in favor of the Stamp Act, from what we can tell. But his approach in London as a lobbyist is essentially to try and mitigate its harm, to make it less harmful to colonists. So he sort of lobbies around the edges to suggest that it's not a great idea to try and limit its impact. And then to the extent that he has been able to do that, he then sees that they're planning to appoint stamp officers for the colonies, somebody in each colony to be responsible for distributing these stamps and collecting the money, the stamp duty, the tax. And so he tries to make sure that some of his friends get appointed to it, right? It's a sort of, if you can't beat them, join them kind of argument. So he is not very popular in the colonies, actually, in 1765. And he sends this advice back to David Hall, who he's still partnered with, and says, there's been this stamp tax in England for 50 years. Here's how you get around it and sends him a list of advice. You print the advertisements separately on a separate sheet of paper and just give that away. And then you don't have to pay a stamp duty on that. And you force people to pay up front. And subscribers are terrible about paying anyway. So even with fewer subscribers, you'll still be making more money. So you'll be fine. So given that sort of circumstance, I kind of think that Franklin would not have been a particularly popular figure in the colonies. He was not in 1765, at the edge of political radicalism that we sort of think of him later on, he was part of a relatively older generation and part of a more small C conservative group that he was trying to think through, well, how do I manage this as a problem rather than I need to oppose this with all my heart and soul and make sure that this never takes effect. And so I think if he had tried to weather it, he would have faced some difficult straits. I mean, Hall has a difficult time in Philadelphia as he's following Franklin's advice and working from a sort of similar philosophy of navigating the stamp back crisis. He doesn't support it. No printer supports it because it targets their business. But he doesn't want to take these sort of active measures against British imperial authority. And I think Franklin would have struggled quite a lot as well with trying to navigate from a very much colonial printer's perspective of a shifting ground there's generational things going on where the younger printers in the 1760s and 70s tend to be pushing a lot harder against in both directions, but tend to be pushing a lot harder. And a lot of these sort of more neutral, more nervous printers tend to be of Franklin's older generation. The reason the question bends my mind is the sort of bigger question of if Franklin is a printer in 1765, that means he hasn't flown his kite. That means he hasn't become the most famous American in the world in 1765. And so in terms of his impact on the revolution, I think would be considerably less. Each individual printer, I think, matters and matters more or less. And I think Franklin would have mattered a little more than most because of his otherwise prominence in the printing business. But if he's still printing in 1765, that means that he probably hasn't had time to do his electrical experiments. He hasn't been off in London serving as an agent for Pennsylvania and making all sorts of connections in London. And both of those things pay big dividends when you get into the revolution where he's able to you know, negotiate with some people from England and maintain relationships during the war that help when negotiations start. And that he's able to walk into Paris as the American ambassador and he's a known entity. People have heard of him. They've read about his electrical experiments. And if he had been printing in 1765 in Philadelphia, that's not true. So, I mean, who knows what that means in terms of, I mean, we would have, might have had John Adams in Paris. Gosh, that might have been a disaster to have Adams in Paris negotiating instead of Franklin. So, Joe, now that you've investigated printers in the American Revolution, what aspect of history are you researching now? 
I am working more on Franklin, as a matter of fact. I am shifting and taking a closer look at the post office in early America to find out and think about the ways that it operated as a communications network overall. And a big part of that story is going to be Benjamin Franklin, who was, as I said, deputy postmaster general for 20 years. He was postmaster of Philadelphia for 15 years before that. And so it's going to be a story that runs from early in the colonial era uh, and tries to think about the post as this sort of, it's a very weird entity that's both a civic institution, it's a government entity, but we interact with it as a revenue generating business, right? You go and you pay for a service, which is unusual for government entities. And so I want to think about that sort of conflict and contradiction and how it's played out over time. And how can we contact you if we have more questions about early American printers and the business of printing during the American Revolution? Yeah, so there's lots of ways. So I'm on Twitter and active on that at J.M. Edelman. If you use Facebook, I have a Facebook author page now. So if you just look me up as Joseph M. Edelman, I should appear. If you want to email me with questions, I'm happy to do that. And my email is edelman.joseph at gmail.com. Any of those work. And I would love to talk to people more about the printing trade in the American Revolution. Joseph Edelman, thank you for stopping by and for taking us through the work and networks printers used during the American Revolution. Thanks very much. I had a lot of fun. Printers served as the connective tissue of the American Revolution. Their offices served as hubs of information, places where the networks they built between fellow printers, government officials, merchants, sailors, neighbors, and family members brought in news from other places and helped printers put their information out into the world. Of course, along the way, printers decided what information they put out into the world. As Joe related, printers had ideological and business interests that really impacted the information they printed and reported. For example, while many printers may have agreed with the ideas espoused by John Dickinson and Thomas Paine, their decision to reprint Dickinson and Paine's ideas into separate pamphlets was often a business decision. The revolution sold. And interest in Paine and Dickinson's ideas might help printers earn some extra money by selling their ideas in pamphlet form. For printers, the real trick came in balancing their political and business interests with their desire for a free and open press. How could printers use their newspapers and other print media to convey ideas they wanted to spread, while also preserving their platforms as open forums for free debate about social, political, and economic issues? Printers had to find a balance. Having a free and open press was really important. Printers wanted their newspapers and print media to serve as independent checks upon government. Because reporting on government and revealing government plans helps check corruption. As does making the public aware of issues that might impact it, and then providing the public with a place where they can debate how to handle those issues. As Joe revealed, this balance was really tricky to maintain. Still, early Americans viewed newspapers and the press as important bulwarks of liberty defensive mechanisms against government, designed to preserve and protect the people's liberty. Now, understanding the role printers and the press played during the American Revolution changes how we view the revolution. Through the lens of printers, we can see that everyday people helped to shape and spread the revolution's ideas. We can also see that for some, the choice of whether to become a revolutionary, remain loyal, or to try and stay neutral was a business decision as much as it was an ideological decision. Plus, through the lives of printers, we can also see inside the process of how revolutionary ideas took shape, how they spread, and how they were able to take hold in the hearts and minds of Americans. For more information about Joe, his book, Revolutionary Networks, plus notes for everything we talked about today, check out the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com 243. The 4th of July is coming, and the Ben Franklin's World shop is getting its first round of limited edition t-shirts. You don't want to miss these. So check them out at benfranklinsworld.com slash shop. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Our awesome custom theme music was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. Finally, I'm curious what you think. Joe noted that in the 18th century, newspapers tended to print more news from abroad and other colonies than they did of news from within their local communities. And today, we're having a big debate in our society about the state of local news and whether we even need local news because we have so much national and world news. And I'd love to know what you think about this debate. So let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production 
of the Omohundro Institute.